Hi there, boys and girls. Welcome once again to Story Hour. Today, all our stories are about some of my favorite people, grandparents. Our first story won an award. It won the Caldecott Medal Award for its illustrations. The story is Grandfather's Journey by Alan Say. My grandfather was a young man when he left his home in Japan and went to see the world. He wore European clothes for the first time and began his journey on a steamship. The Pacific Ocean astonished him. For three weeks he did not see land. When land finally appeared, it was the New World. He explored North America by train and riverboat, and often walked for days on end. Deserts with rocks like enormous sculptures amazed him. The endless farm fields reminded him of the ocean he had crossed. Huge cities of factories and tall buildings bewildered and yet excited him. He marveled at the towering mountains and rivers as clear as the sky. He met many people along the way. He shook hands with black men and white men, with yellow men and red men. The more he traveled, the more he longed to see new places and never thought of returning home. Of all the places he visited, he liked California best. He loved the strong sunlight there, the Sierra Mountains, the lonely sea coast. After a time, he returned to his village in Japan to marry his childhood sweetheart. Then he brought his bride to the new country. They made their home by the San Francisco Bay and had a baby girl. As his daughter grew, my grandfather began to think about his own childhood. He thought about his old friends. He remembered the mountains and rivers of his home. He surrounded himself with songbirds, but he could not forget. Finally, when his daughter was nearly grown, he could wait no more. He took his family and returned to his homeland. Once again, he saw the mountains and rivers of his childhood. They were just as he had remembered them. Once again, he exchanged stories and laughed with his old friends. But the village was not a place for a daughter from San Francisco. So my grandfather bought a house in a large city nearby. There the young woman fell in love, married, and sometime later I was born. When I was a small boy, my favorite weekend was a visit to my grandfather's house. He told me many stories about California. He raised warblers and silver eyes but he could not forget the mountains and rivers of California. So he planned a trip. But a war began. Bombs fell from the sky and scattered our lives like leaves in a storm. When the war ended, there was nothing left of the city and of the house where my grandparents had lived. So they returned to the village where they had been children. But my grandfather never kept another songbird. The last time I saw him, my grandfather said that he longed to see California one more time. He never did. And when I was nearly grown, I left home and went to see California for myself. After a time, I came to love the land my grandfather had loved, and I stayed on and on until I had a daughter of my own. 
but I also miss the mountains and rivers of my childhood. I miss my old friends, so I return now and then when I cannot still the longing in my heart. The funny thing is, the moment I am in one country, I am homesick for the other. I think I know my grandfather now. I miss him very much. Grandfather's Journey by Alan Say Grandmothers go by all sorts of names. In Spanish-speaking countries, grandmothers are often referred to as abuela or abuelita. In our next story, set in Guatemala, we're going to learn about a special grandmother. The story is called Abuela's Weave, written by Omar S. Castaneda and illustrated by Enrique O. Sanchez. Pull back hard, old abuela said. Make it jolt so the threads stay close like family. Yes, abuela. Esperanza thrust the bolt through the opened weave and pulled the bar down with all her might. Next to her, Esperanza's grandmother, her abuela, also kneeled in front of a blackstrap loom. Both looms were tied to the same tree in the middle of the family compound. Esperanza's mother fed the chickens and pigs behind the main thatch hut, while her father was off with her brothers in the field of corn, beans, and coffee. You're learning, Abuela said. Esperanza looked at her grandmother out of the corner of her eye. She knew that Abuela was nervous about the market. Her mother said that the huipiles and tapestries Abuela could make pull the wonder right out of people. But these days, more and more goods were made by machines. Esperanza worried that people would tease Abuela about her birthmark, as some kids had once done. They had started a rumor that she was a witch, and now many people were frightened to buy things from her. Daydreaming again? Abuela asked. Yes, Abuela. Well, the old woman said gruffly, get busy because there are too few days left. You still have a lot of work to do, and there will be many other people selling the same things you have. Don't worry, Abuela. I'll be busy until we leave. And she was. Esperanza and her grandmother worked from early morning, even before the sun rose, to well past sunset, when the moon rose and the compound fire gave everything the rich smell of pine. They showed no one their work, not even Esperanza's mother because it was a special thing that they wove. They wanted to wait for the Fiesta de Pueblos in Guate to reveal it. Soon the day arrived, bright with sun, the leaves glistening from the previous night's rain. It seemed like a good omen for Esperanza and her grandmother. Abuela appeared disguised as a woman in mourning. Dressed in black, she wrapped a long black shawl around her shoulders and across her face so that only her eyes appeared to the world. Esperanza, however, wore her favorite huipil. It was a white blouse with red, blue, and green threads in the rectangular collar. Under that, the colors bled into silver and blue and hidden within the intricate designs of the blouse were tiny kestals flying freely in the threads the way they once flew in the great forests of Guatemala. She carried on her head a large straw basket full of her whipiles, tablecloths, skirts, and the special tapestry. 
Esperanza walked steadily down the dirt avenue of Santa Cruz to get to the highway where the Guate bus would pick them up. Abuela walked several paces behind. She insisted that they pretend they did not know each other. This way, if my birthmark frightens customers, they will still buy from you, Abuela explained. When the bus came, Abuela did not even help lift the heavy basket to the boys who strapped bags onto the roof of the bus. Inside, they sat three seats apart, as if they were strangers, people living in different villages, people with no ancestors in common. When they arrived, the noise in the city was deafening. Large buses roared down the narrow streets, emitting clouds of black fumes. Horns blasted, and people hurried roughly down the sidewalks. Esperanza wanted more than anything to get off the Sexta Avenida, where people jammed the walkways and hawkers yelled from their shops or from the hundreds of carts blocking the sidewalks and streets. She felt trapped. Her lungs ached from the automobile and bus fumes, and her ears rang with the sounds of screeching brakes, horns, shouting, and the whistles of policemen. Esperanza walked quickly the basket steady upon her head, her mind trying to focus away from the commotion and onto the stalls set up for the fiesta in the Parque Central. She walked furiously, zigzagging to get down to Avenida Ocho or the Septima Avenida where the noise was less. When she suddenly stopped to see if Abuela was still following behind, she looked for a familiar face among the bobbing heads, the baskets, the helmets, and hats. She wanted to catch just a sight of her grandmother's shawl, like a blackbird hopping from branch to branch in a forest of people. But she could not find her. Esperanza continued to the market, hoping Abuela would eventually find her there among the other merchants. The stalls were already filled when Esperanza arrived. Old men and women nearby shooed her away or ignored her when she asked for help. At last, all she could do was set her basket between the narrow slats of two stalls. On one side, a family from Antigua sold pottery, reproductions of Mayan craft, and clothing loomed in one of the many factories. The woman on the other side sold long bolts of cloth, musical instruments, and decorative bags. The bags all had zippers machined in the capital and long handles of colorful plastic. Everything was beautiful, Esperanza thought. She thought that no one would buy anything from her. She and her grandmother would return to Santa Cruz with no money. The long hours wasted and the family disappointed. Esperanza sadly took out her wares to hang them one by one on long splinters in the slat wood on either side. She felt terribly alone. Even her poor abuelita was nowhere to be seen. The people slowly noticed. They pointed at the elaborate weaving. Tourists and Guatemalans alike drew closer to her tiny place and looked up with wonder at the beautiful work in front of them. The large tapestry blossomed with images of Guatemala. Esperanza and Abuela had worked in intricate symbols of the country's history. There were heroines and heroes inspired by the glorious Popol Vuh, the sacred book of the Maya. And in one corner, a beautiful Quetzal 
seemed to watch over it all from within a white cage. In Esperanza's hands, the tapestry's colors shone as brightly as the sun over Guatemala's Lake Atitlan. People turned from the commercial stalls to stand before Esperanza's complex weaving. When she looked up, Esperanza saw Abuela with a smile across her birthmarked face. It didn't take long for all of their work to be sold that day. The people were disappointed when all was gone, but Esperanza promised to return with new things the following month. And on the way back to Santa Cruz, grandmother and granddaughter sat side by side. Esperanza's smooth and nimble fingers held tightly in her abuela's wrinkled old hands. Abuela's Weave by Omar S. Castaneda, illustrated by Enrique O. Sanchez, a story from Guatemala. Do you like to take toys in the bathtub with you? Well, if you do, you'll enjoy our next story. The Tub Grandfather by Pam Conrad with illustrations by Richard Eaglesky. One day, the tub child led the tub people in a parade around the rug. There was the mother, the father, the grandmother, the policeman, the doctor, and the dog. The tub mother made music like a marching flute, and the tub father made noise like a marching drum. They all stomped their feet along the edge of the round rug. The rug was close to the radiator, and under the radiator, near the wall, in the darkness, there lay a little wooden man. He was on his side and covered with dust. He didn't move or make a sound. It was warm under the radiator, warm and dark, and no one had looked there for a long time. The tub people did not see him at all. Soon the grandmother walked to the center of the rug. This is a sunny field from long ago, she told them all. I must plant seeds like I did back then and she walked along the braided rows, dropping seeds as she went. Her back was to the radiator, and she didn't see anyone underneath. Then the policeman said, now it's time to play ball. And when they lined up three by three, the policeman kicked the ball to them, but they missed, and it rolled and rolled over the rug and across the wooden floor. It rolled beneath the radiator. I'll get it, called the tub child. He ran across the rug, across the wooden floor, and under the radiator. Soon they heard him calling, Mama! Bring out the ball, honey, she said. But Mama! Hurry, said his father, before the policeman and the doctor get a home run. But the tub child didn't move. He stood beneath the radiator and stared out at them. Someone's here, he whispered. Someone's sleeping in the dust. Who? asked the father. Who is it? the mother asked, coming closer. The tub dog went right up to the little wooden man and sniffed and jumped and barked. Very carefully, the tub mother and tub father began to roll the little wooden man out from under the radiator. Shall I arrest him? asked the policeman. Shall I get a bandage? asked the doctor. The tub grandmother shushed the dog and leaned over the dusty wooden man who lay on his side. Walter? she whispered. Walter, dear, is that you? But the little wooden man did not answer. Together they rolled him out into the center of the rug where they could see him better. They dusted him off and stood him up. 
One eye was worn away and the other eye was closed. The tub people made a soft circle around him. Who's Walter? asked the tub child. Your grandfather, the tub mother answered, and he stayed very close to her. He'll have to open his eye, said the tub father. Let's see if he'll play ball with us. So they stood the tub grandfather at the edge of the rug and rolled the ball to him. It rolled and rolled across the rug and stopped at his feet. But he didn't move. He did not open his eye. Oh dear, sighed the tub grandmother. A parade, said the tub child, and he began to march along the edge of the rug. A loud parade, he said, and one by one the others joined him. They made a very loud parade, but nothing worked. The tub grandfather stood woodenly at the edge of the rug and did not open his eye. Later that night, the tub people lined up along the window sill. Now there were eight of them, the father, the mother, the grandmother, the doctor, the policeman, the child, the dog, and the grandfather. They stood quietly. None of them looked at the tub grandfather, but they knew his eye was closed. There's one more thing we can try, said the policeman in the darkness. An ambulance, asked the doctor. Chicken soup, asked the grandmother. The tub, answered the policeman. Tomorrow we'll take him to the tub. The next morning, the eight tub people stood along the edge of the bathtub. It was empty and dry. The drain was dark. Do you remember this, Walter? The grandmother asked. He did not answer. Let's go down, said the tub father. And at that, he slid down the inside of the tub. The tub mother followed. Then the grandmother, the doctor, the policeman, and the dog all slid down. They waved and called, but the tub child and his grandfather stood alone on the edge of the tub. I'll watch, said the tub child. The tub grandfather said nothing at all, not even on the edge of the tub. So back to the round rug they went. They stood the grandfather in the middle and thought about him. There was nothing left to do. Walter, the tub grandfather, wouldn't talk, he wouldn't play, and he wouldn't open his eye. Just then the radiator began to whistle, a low, quiet whistle like an old tune. Very slowly and so slightly you could barely notice the tub grandfather began to rock on his wooden feet. The tub grandmother knew what to do. She went up to her wooden man and began to hum. He opened his eye and looked at her. Can that be honeysuckle that I smell? He asked her. She nodded and they began to dance. They danced through all the flowers she had planted in her sunny field from long ago. The tub people smiled and quietly watched them and the tune went on and on. Now at night there are eight tub people on the windowsill. The father, the mother, the grandmother, the doctor, the policeman, the child, the dog, and the grandfather. And the grandfather still likes to sleep on his side. The Tub Grandfather A story by Pam Conrad with illustrations by Richard Eaglesky. Here's another story about a grandmother. When Grandma Came by Jill Peyton Walsh and Sophie Williams.
When Grandma came to stay, she said to Madeline, I have been to Mount Desert Island far away and seen the shape of a great whale rolling in the deep. But I have never, no, never seen anything as tremendous as you. I have been to the Arctic ice plains far away and watched the polar bear amble and gamble at midnight. But I have never, no, never known anything as wakeful as you. I have been to the lake shores of Africa far away and seen the great hippopotamus roll in the mud banks. But I have never, no, never seen anything as messy as you. I have been to the bush in Australia far away and met the kangaroo bounding across the grasslands. But I have never, no, never met anything as bouncy as you. I have been to the jungles of India far away and heard the tiger roar in the stripy shadows. But I have never, no, never heard anything as rowdy as you. I have sailed on the great Nile River far away and seen how the land grows green between desert and desert. But I have never, no, never known anything growing like you. I remember moonlight and starlight on valleys and mountains, and seas and cities and gardens the wide world over. But I never remember anything as heaven and earthly as you. I love you too, Grandma, said Madeline. When Grandma came, by Jill Peyton Walsh and Sophie Williams. And I'm sure when your grandma comes to visit, she thinks that no matter where she has been, she's never ever met anyone like you. I know my grandma felt that way. When I am old with you, a story by Angela Johnson with pictures by David Soman. When I am old with you, Granddaddy, I will sit in a big rocking chair beside you and talk about everything. An old dog will sit at my feet and I will swat flies all afternoon. We'll go fishing too, Granddaddy, down by that old pond with the flat rocks all around. We can fish beside the pond or take that old canoe out. We'll eat out of the picnic basket all day and we won't catch any fish. But that's all right, Granddaddy. When I am old with you, Granddaddy, we will play cards all day underneath that old tree by the road. We'll drink cool water from a jug and wave at all the cars that go by. We'll play cards till the lightning bugs shine in the trees. And we won't mind that we forgot to keep score, Granddaddy. When I am old with you, Granddaddy, we will open up that old cedar trest and try on all the old clothes that your granddaddy left you. We can look at the old pictures and try to imagine the people in them. It might make us cry, but that's okay. In the mornings, granddaddy, we will cook bacon for breakfast and that's all. 
We can eat it on the porch, too. In the evening, we can roast corn on a big fire and invite everyone we know to come over and eat it. They'll all dance, play cards, and talk about everything. When I am old with you, Granddaddy, we can take a trip to the ocean. Have you ever seen the ocean, Granddaddy? We'll walk on the hot sand and throw rocks at the waves. We can wear big hats in the afternoon like everyone else. And we'll sit in the water when the day gets cool. When our trip is over, we will follow the ocean as far as we can, so we'll never forget it. When I am old with you, Granddaddy, we will get on the tractor and ride through the fields of grass. We will see the trees in the distance and remember when this field was a forest. We won't be sad, though. Granddaddy, when I am old with you, we will take long walks and speak to all the people who walk by us. We'll know them all, Granddaddy, and they'll know us. At the end of our walk, when we're tired, Granddaddy, I will sit in a big rocking chair beside you. When I am old with you, a story by Angela Johnson with pictures by David Solman. Big Mamas by Donald Cruz. Did you see her? Did you see Big Mama? We called our grandma Big Mama. Not that she was big, but she was Mama's Mama. Every summer we went to see her. Mama, my sisters, my brother and me. Daddy had to work. He'd come later. It took three days and two nights on the train. Now we were nearly there. Cottondale, Cottondale, next station stop, Cottondale, yelled the conductor to the nearly empty train. Don't leave no babies on this train. He made the same joke year after year. My uncle Slank came for us by car. We always hoped he'd come with a horse and wagon, but he never did. We crossed back over the train tracks a turn or two along the red dirt road and onto the lane in front of Big Mama's house. Big Mama and Big Papa were waiting for us on the porch. There were hugs and kisses and oh my, how you've grown and how tall you are. Is this you? Then off with our shoes and socks. We wouldn't need them much in the next few weeks. Now to see that nothing had changed. In the hall, the sewing machine that you had to pedal like a bicycle. The big clock over the fireplace. The wind-up record player. The kerosene lamps and the Sears Roebuck catalogs. Our room, my brothers and mine and Uncle Slank's. Across the hall, the room where my sisters and mama slept. Next to it, big mama's and big papa's room. Then to the back porch. Off the porch, there were three rooms. The tiny extra room, no bigger than the bed in it. None of us wanted to sleep there alone. The dining room with the big round table and chairs, and next to it, the kitchen. On the porch was the washstand, where we washed our hands, faces, and feet. At the end of the porch was the well. Don't fall in, we were told every year. No one ever did. We stood on tiptoe to watch the bucket go down and fill with water so that we could have a drink from the dipper that hung nearby. Everything was just the same. In the backyard was the chicken coop, where Sunday dinner's chicken spent its last day. 
Behind the shed full of old stuff was the outhouse. Okay now, but scary in the dark. We stopped for a drink at the pump. We ran past the pear tree where the turkeys roosted at night. Under the tractor in front of the tool shed was a good place to look for nests with eggs in them. Next to the tool shed was a huge empty pot for making syrup from sugarcane juice. I dug some worms from the big pile of cane pulp. Wigglers were the best kind for fishing and I chose a pole. The barn was another place to look for eggs. On to the stable to see Nancy and Maud. Maud was friendly but Nancy was a biter. Down the path past the cow pen and the pig pen to the pond. The flat bottomed boat was still there. Plenty of water for fishing and swimming this year. Everything just as it should be. A fish, a fish, I got one, I got one, I yelled. Woo, woo, the train whistle. Dinner time. Everybody sitting around the table that filled the room. Big Mama, Big Papa, Uncle Slank, our cousins from down the road, and all of us. We talked about what we did last year. We talked about what we were going to do this year. We talked so much, we hardly had time to eat. The night was jet black, except for millions of stars. We could hardly sleep thinking about things to come. Some nights, even now, I think that I might wake up in the morning and be at Big Mama's with the whole summer ahead of me. Big Mama's by Donald Cruz Not everybody has a grandmother or a grandfather, but usually there's somebody in the neighborhood who can act like your grandmother. And in this story, we meet just such a lady, Miss Tizzy, by Libba Moore Gray, illustrated by Jada Rowland. Miss Tizzy always wore a purple hat with a white flower in it and high top green tennis shoes. The neighbors thought her peculiar, but the children loved her. Miss Tizzy's house was pink and sat like a fat blossom in the middle of a street with white houses, white fences, and very neat flower gardens. Miss Tizzy had no fence at all, but she had flowers that grew everywhere and spilled over onto the sidewalk. Miss Tizzy let the children pick the flowers. Then she gave them clean glass jelly jars to put them in, and the children loved it. Miss Tizzy's big yellow cat, Hiram, slept in a window box in the middle of some red geraniums. Sometimes he climbed on her shoulders and hung there like a tired old fur piece. On Mondays, Miss Tizzy baked cookies. She let the neighborhood children put in the raisins and then lick the bowl while the cookies were baking. The children loved it. On Tuesdays, Miss Tizzy made puppets out of old socks. She made a puppet for each boy and girl. They made up their own stories and put on shows for Miss Tizzy. She laughed and clapped every time, and the children loved it. On Wednesdays, Miss Tizzy played her bagpipes. She gave the children spoons and pans and let them pretend they were playing real drums. Each Wednesday, one child got to be special and play a silver penny whistle. Every child got a turn. They marched up and down the street with Miss Tizzy and her bagpipes leading the parade. Hiram sometimes marched along, and the children loved it. 
On Thursdays, Miss Tizzy gave the children clean white paper and crayons. They drew pictures of sunshine and butterflies. They put them in Miss Tizzy's red wagon and delivered them all over town to people who had stopped smiling and had grown too tired to come out of their houses anymore. Hiram rode in the front of the wagon with a red ribbon around his neck and the children loved it. On Fridays, Miss Tizzy opened her trunk and they all played dress up. There were hats with feathers and hats with bows. There were baseball caps and straw hats with bright red bands. Everyone wore a hat. Miss Tizzy put on a lace shawl and served pink lemonade in her best china cups. The children loved it. On Saturdays, Miss Tizzy put roller skates on her green tennis shoes and went up and down the sidewalks. The children came out of the white houses and joined her. They made a roller skate train holding on to Miss Tizzy's long skirt. Hiram was usually the caboose. The children made train sounds and Miss Tizzy was the engineer. She never scolded the children for being too loud and the children loved it. On Sundays when the day was over, the children stretched out on bright quilts in Miss Tizzy's backyard and looked up at the stars. The tree frogs croaked their summer sounds as Miss Tizzy sang songs about the moon, slightly off key. The children didn't care, they loved it. One day, Miss Tizzy took off her purple hat with a white flower and laid it on the window seat. Then she took off her high top green tennis shoes and placed them under her high white bed. Miss Tizzy lay down on her feather mattress. She was very sick. Hiram left his window box and curled up at her feet. He did not purr anymore. The doctor came and went. He shook his head and looked very serious. The children were sad. They didn't know what to do. They missed their grown-up friend. Finally, they had an idea. On Monday, they baked cookies with raisins and brought them to the pink house. On Tuesday, they stood in the yard and held up puppets to the window. They put on a puppet show just for Miss Tizzy. On Wednesday, they brought pans and spoons and played a soft little drumming sound just outside the door. On Thursday, they drew pictures with orange and red crayons and put them in Miss Tizzy's mailbox. On Friday, they put on funny hats and left a tea tray on the front door. They left Hiram a bowl of cool milk. On Saturday, they put a brand new pair of skates in a big box with a purple ribbon on top and took them to Miss Tizzy. On Sunday, when the sun went away, the children stood underneath Miss Tizzy's window. They sang all the moon songs she had taught them. Miss Tizzy's hat glowed in the moonlight. She was having a peaceful dream. She heard the children singing and she loved it. Miss Tizzy by Libamore Gray, illustrated by Jada Rowland. I'm sure you know somebody in your neighborhood just like Miss Tizzy. Do you always expect your grandparents to be in the best of moods? Well, listen to this next story. Grandma Gets Grumpy by Anna Grossnickel Hines. Every time we go to my grandma's house, we stay all night. Mama and Papa sleep on the sofa bed in the living room. I sleep in my sleeping bag on the floor in grandma's room. Now don't snore, Lassen. Grandma says, 
I don't snore, you snore, I say. But we're just teasing each other. Grandma plays go fish with me and tickles me with her silly goose puppet. Papa says, sofas are for sitting on. Mama says, stop running in the house. Grandma gives me hugs and says, she just has lots of energy. Don't you, Lassen? Grandma has a box of toys and a whole drawer full of old clothes for playing dress up. She likes kids. Mama says, time to clean up. Papa says, get ready for bed and brush your teeth. Grandma reads me stories and gives me ice cream. I like to stay all night with Grandma. The last time we visited Grandma, Mama and Papa went to a party at Aunt Sue and Uncle Jim's house. Grandma said they had to sleep over there because all my cousins were coming to stay with Grandma and me. Yippee, I said. Not so loud, Lassen, said Papa. Are you sure you want to do this, Mom? Mama asked. Don't worry, Grandma said. We'll get along fine, won't we, Lassen? Aunt Sue brought Brian and Kevin. Here they are, Mom, she said. Are you sure you want to do this? We'll be fine, won't we, boys, Grandma said. She winked at us. Uncle Joe and Aunt Sherry brought Casey and Michelle. Brian and Kevin and Casey and Michelle and I all hugged each other and yelled, Hooray! Hooray! Quiet down, Uncle Joe said. Be good, said Mama. Do what Grandma tells you, said Aunt Sue. Are you sure you can handle all five of them, Mom? asked Uncle Joe. Sure, Grandma said. You go on and have a good time. We'll be fine. Grandma shooed all the grown-ups out and closed the door behind them. She made hot dogs, macaroni and cheese, and green beans for dinner. We like hot dogs, macaroni and cheese, and green beans. Then Brian and Casey and I played Chinese checkers. Kevin and Michelle made a tower of blocks. We made a bigger one. They both crashed. We made a tower of kids. Kevin got squished because he's too little. He started crying. Be careful, Grandma said. We zoomed the cars under the sofa. We zoomed ourselves on top of the sofa. Settle down, Grandma said. Someone might get hurt. Whee! Casey tried one more zoom. Grandma looked at him. She wasn't smiling. We settled down. We made roads for the cars. We made them go all over the house. Grandma doesn't care if we make a big mess. She likes kids. I put on a beautiful dress to be a princess. Brian was the dad. Casey was the fireman. Michelle got run over by the fireman. I was the doctor and fixed her up. We made a hospital with all the blankets and chairs and pillows. Casey was the ambulance man. Brian was the nurse. Michelle and Kevin were the patients, but they wanted to be doctors too. Grandma looks sick, I said. I think she needs to go to the hospital. We took very good care of Grandma. Michelle got in Grandma's lap and yawned a big, big yawn. Then Kevin yawned. Then Grandma yawned. I think it's time to clean up, she said. But we're not done playing yet, we said. You can play again tomorrow, said Grandma. How about cleaning this up, then reading some stories? We wanted stories, but that mess was big. It was too big to clean up. Let's have stories first and then clean up, I said. Yes, 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 said the other kids. No, Grandma said, the mess gets picked up first. I sat down on the floor for just one little minute. Lassen's not helping, Brian said. I picked up a car. I am too helping, I said. Good, Grandma said, we need everyone's help. I was getting a big blanket. Casey was getting it too. We fell down on top of each other. Casey and I made a ghost together under the blanket and scared Kevin. Kevin jumped on the sofa. The ghost jumped on the sofa too. Brian climbed on the sofa to save his brother. Ooh, said the ghost. Ooh. Kevin squealed. Get back, you old ghost, yelled Brian. Kevin 
accidentally kicked Michelle. She screamed. Don't hurt my sister, Casey yelled at Kevin. Brian pushed Casey. You leave my little brother alone. Casey bumped into me. I bumped into the lamp. Stop, Grandma shouted. We didn't know she could shout. That is too dangerous and too noisy and that sofa is for sitting on, not jumping on. We sat on the sofa. Grandma picked up her lamp. Grandma's getting grumpy, Casey whispered. She sounds just like my mom, I whispered back. Mine too, Brian said. And my dad, said Casey. You bet I do, Grandma said. We didn't know she had such good ears. That's because I taught Lassen's mom and Brian's mom and Casey's dad everything they know about being grumpy. And I'm older, so I've had more practice. Grandma sat in the chair. She looked at us. We looked at her. What are you going to do now, Casey said. I'm going to wait, Grandma said. Grandma waited. We waited too. What are you waiting for, Brian asked. I don't know, Grandma said. We didn't know either. We all waited some more. Waiting was boring. I got up and put away the blanket. Casey put the pillows back on the sofa. Brian and Kevin picked up the dress-up clothes. Michelle picked up the cars. Grandma helped. Casey looked at Brian and they grinned. Brian looked at me and I started to giggle. I looked at Kevin and Michelle and they laughed. Michelle looked at Grandma. Grandma laughed too. All of us were laughing and putting things away. Grandma wasn't grumpy anymore. Pretty soon that big mess was all cleaned up and we were eating ice cream. Now it's time to brush your teeth and get into your pajamas, Grandma said. Oh no, Casey said. We aren't tired, I started to say. But Grandma's eyebrows went up. We got our toothbrushes. Watch this, I said. I squeezed a toothpaste smile on the mirror. Ooh, yes, yeah, said Casey. Make the eyes. Brian shook his head and pointed to the doorway. Grandma did not look happy. I cleaned off the smile very, very carefully. We all got our pajamas on while Grandma changed the sofa into a bed. We climbed in and Grandma read three stories. Then she tucked us in and the silly goose puppet gave us kisses. Good night, you rascals, Grandma said. Grandma really does like kids and we like Grandma. Grandma Gets Grumpy by Anna Grosnickel Hines. Our next story is from a new series called My First Little House Books. It's based on the stories by Laura Ingalls Wilder. And this story is called Dance at Grandpa's. Once upon a time, a little girl named Laura lived in the big woods of Wisconsin in a little house made of logs. She lived there with her pa, her ma, her big sister Mary, her baby sister Carrie, and their good old bulldog, Jack. One winter morning, everyone got up early, for there was going to be a big party at Grandpa's house. While Laura and Mary ate their breakfast, Pa packed his fiddle carefully in its box and put it in the big sled waiting by the gate. The air was frosty cold, but Laura, May, Carrie, and Ma were tucked in snug and warm under robes in the sled. The horses pranced, the sleigh bells rang merrily, and they went off through the big woods to Grandpa's house. It did not seem long before they were sweeping into the clearing at Grandpa's house. Grandma stood at the door, smiling and calling them to come in. Gra Laura loved Grandma's big house. It was fun to run from the fireplace at one end of the big room all the way to Grandma's soft feather bed on the other side. 
the whole house smelled good. There were sweet and spicy smells coming from the kitchen, and the smell of hickory logs burning with bright, clear flames in the fireplace. Before long, it was time to get ready for the party. Laura watched while Ma and the aunts made themselves pretty. They combed their long hair and put on their best dresses. Laura thought Ma was the most beautiful of all in her green ruffled dress. Soon people began to come to the party. They came on foot through the woods with their lanterns and they came in sleds and wagons. Sleigh bells were jingling all the time. The big room was filled with tall boots and swishing skirts and there were ever so many babies lying in rows on Grandma's feather bed. Laura thought baby Carrie was the prettiest. Then Pa took out his fiddle and began to play. All the skirts began to swirl and all the boots began to stamp. Swing your partners, Pa called. Laura watched Ma's skirt swing and her dark head bowing and thought she was the loveliest dancer in the world. Soon it was time for dinner. The long table was loaded with pumpkin pies, dried berry pies, and cookies. There was cold boiled pork and salt rising bread. How sour the pickles were. They all ate until they could eat no more. The fiddling and dancing went on and on until it was time for Laura and the other children to go to bed. When Laura woke up, it was morning. There were pancakes and maple syrup for breakfast, and then Pa brought the horses and sled to the door. Pa tucked Laura and Mary and Carrie and Ma into the sled. Grandma and Grandpa stood calling, Goodbye, goodbye as they rode away into the big woods going home. What a wonderful party it had been. Dance at Grandpa's, based on the Little House in the Prairie books by Laura Ingalls Wilder.